Hey, it's good to be here this morning. Good to see you. My first time at Shasta Bible College, so it's great to be here. I'm enjoying it. I uh, teach adjunct faculty at Corbin University up in Salem, Oregon. That's where I'm living. So I have uh, seniors uh, for a leadership class that are ministry majors, and we meet on Tuesday and Thursday morning, so I'll be getting up at 6 tomorrow morning to go teach them. Um, there's a story of a pastor, lawyer, and doctor. They go out hunting, deer hunting, and they go out to their spots, and it's pitch black out. You know, they're getting ready, getting set before the sun rises. They don't realize they're all facing basically the same general direction. And as the sun starts to come up, they see this massive buck standing in the opening. All three stand and fire simultaneously, and the buck just drops right dead. They come running out, and the lawyer right away is screaming, it's my deer, it's my deer, I'm the one that shot the deer. And the doctor says, settle down, settle down. Let me check the deer out. Maybe I can figure out who shot it. And so he kneels down, and he starts looking the deer over and kind of shakes his head. He said, no, this belongs to the pastor. And the lawyer is like, how do you know that? That's, you know, that's got to be impossible to tell. And he says, well, look, the, the bullet went right in one ear and straight out the other. So, so we're hoping, hoping that doesn't happen today, okay? So it's a great privilege to share the Word of God with you. Um, with young people who are committed to Jesus Christ. And I just want to tell you, after 30 plus years of ministry, I was a Christian school teacher, then I was superintendent of a school for about seven years, and then senior pastor of a church in Indiana for about 22 years, and now with ABWE for about two. That I just want to tell you that it's worth it. It's worth it. I know sometimes you hear the stories on the other side, and there are stories on the other side. You know, sin breaks things down and breaks people down and, and there's some brokenness in the ministry as a result. But I also want you to know there's a, a lot of good in ministry. And I just really want to encourage you that it is worth it. I, I don't regret it at all. I transferred from Michigan State University in my sophomore year to Baptist Bible College out in Pennsylvania. Best decision I ever made. I loved it at MSU, uh, but it wasn't the best place to train to be a pastor. <laughs> And uh, so God called me into that, and uh, I'm really glad I made that decision. And so each one of us, all of us together, had the opportunity to participate in the mission of God. But sometimes we get sidetracked individually and corporately as churches. So we're going to watch this video, if it's ready. And uh, it gives you kind of a, I think, a real clear synopsis of sometimes what happens in churches. I believe it also happens to us as individuals. So we'll watch this, and then we'll dig in. Pretty sobering. You look at that. I, I've seen that video a number of times, and it always gets to me. And to see churches become inward, you know, in our country today, nearly 4,000 churches close every year. And we're seeing millennials, people your age, leaving the church in droves. And the United States has now become, believe it or not, the third largest mission field in the world. There are more lost people in the United States than any country except for China and India. And so we need a new wave of leaders that are willing to get out of their comfort zone and are willing to be focused on the harvest that's all around us. There are now nearly 500 people groups living in the United States. And God could use you to be a part of reaching those people groups. Now, I've got to tell you, after 30 years of ministry, I still enjoy staying in my comfort zone. I don't like to get out of my comfort zone. I'd rather talk to people that I know. I'd rather hang out with my family at my house. I'd rather do what I want to do when I want to do it. If it was up to me, I would just stay in that kind of a situation. And so I have to make a conscious effort to get out of my comfort zone, to go and talk to people maybe I don't know. And, and uh, I think it kind of goes back to junior high school. I remember I was in eighth grade, went to a large junior high school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, over 500 students in each grade, and they had dances for junior high students. I look back at that now, I think, that is really dumb, you know? But I went to the dance, which, by the way, proves I was not raised Baptist, and uh, I was actually raised Episcopalian. So I go to the dance, and you walk in, and it's in the cafeteria, and it's a massive cafeteria, because they're feeding like 500 people at a time. And on one side of the cafeteria are all these uh, dorky-looking 13-year-old boys. I was one of those. And on the other side of the cafeteria are all these cute girls. And in between is this vacuous space. And the only way that you could 
ask a girl to dance was to walk across all alone that vacuous space. And everybody was watching you. Everybody could see you. They knew the question that you were going to ask. And the worst part about it is they also knew what the answer was, <laughs> especially when you walked all the way back across alone. <laughs> and that happened to me more than once. <laughs> Not surprising, right? And so I, I developed this fear of being rejected, this fear of the crossover. And I think we all fear crossovers. And here's a definition of a crossover. Leaving our comfort zone to make a relational connection. That's simple. It's leaving your comfort zone to connect with somebody that's maybe a little bit awkward. Maybe crossing a cultural divide. Somebody who has different values than you. You ever meet people out in our culture who have different values than you? And you know if you get on certain subjects, it's, it's going to be a very interesting, very tense conversation, right? How about talking with somebody maybe of a different generation than you are? Or maybe somebody from a different people group than you're in? Or how about somebody of a different sexual orientation? That's certainly in the news a lot today. Have you ever been uncomfortable sharing the gospel? <laughs> so I'd like to ask you, give you a couple scenarios. Rate yourself from 1 to 10. 10 means you're very, very comfortable. You like it as much as eating a box of chocolates, all right? A one means it's very uncomfortable. You'd rather lick your finger and stick it in a light socket, okay? So first one, meeting a stranger, introducing yourself to a stranger. Ah, for me, that's a, like an eight or nine. Not a big deal after all these years in ministry. I mean, it's not a 10. I'd rather eat chocolate, but, you know, I don't mind meeting strangers. How about sitting next to someone new in church? Believe it or not, for me, that's only maybe an eight. Because as a pastor, I sat in the front row by myself for the last 22 years. And so I'm not particularly used to it, but it doesn't bother me too much. So it's about an eight. I don't know what it would be for you. How about getting to know someone from a different ethnic group? Okay, now I'm starting to move down to about a six. And I've been in 20-some countries around the world. I've been in national partnerships. But every time you meet somebody from another people group, you're at least aware that, hey, I could say something that offends them. I don't want to do that. You know? And so you may be a little less comfortable than you would be in other situations. How about shifting a friendly conversation to a spiritual conversation? Okay, believe it or not, for me, that's starting to move down to like a three right there. You know? And then how about sharing the gospel with a close friend or a family member? And I'm thinking of all my family has come to Christ. I was first. The rest of the family has come to Christ except my oldest brother. And I got to tell you, when I talk to him about Christ, and I have, that's right around a one. It's right around a one because he's just very combative. And I know it's going to be tough. When we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus regularly crossed these kind of boundaries to love people who are disconnected from God. Matthew and Zacchaeus, tax collectors, right? I mean, very uncomfortable for a respectable Jewish rabbi to talk to them. Uh, the lepers that Jesus connected with, he even reached out and touched them. Demoniacs. One of his most famous stories was a story about two religious people who refused to cross over. There was a guy beaten up and left for dead. He was robbed. And these two religious people, you know, they, no way were they going to cross over and be bothered with this guy. And then Jesus talks about a Samaritan comes along, and he crosses over, even though it was inconvenient, even though it would cost him something, even though he had other things on his agenda for that day, he still crossed over and ministered to this man. And I think it's important to recognize, to fulfill the second command to love your neighbor, you have to cross over. You can't love someone and stay on your side of the street. just can't be done. And so I want to look at one of the most famous crossover stories in the Bible, and it's in John chapter 4. Now, as you turn to John 4, I want to give you the context. The end of chapter 2, Jesus is, has done some miracles, and the people want to make him some kind of a leader, maybe their Messiah. We're not quite sure exactly what they have in mind. But it says Jesus was not interested in that because he knew what was in the heart of man. And then I believe we have in chapter 3 and chapter 4 two examples of Jesus knowing what's in the heart of man. Example 1, Nicodemus. Nicodemus is at the top of the socioeconomic scale. He's a religious leader, well-respected, probably had some money. But Jesus knows that Nicodemus has a heart that's unsaved. And so he knows that Nicodemus needs to be born again. And then we move to chapter 4, and we have someone at the exact opposite end of the scale, right? She's a woman. We don't even know her name. 
She's a woman of ill repute. She's been married five times. She's living with a man she's not married to. She probably has very little money, very little respect, and certainly doesn't seem very, quote, religious. And Jesus knows she needs to be born again as well. And so the primary point in these two stories is that everyone is lost and anyone can be saved. And that includes me, includes you. So let's look at the specifics of the story. Starting at verse 4, we see that Jesus had to go talk to this woman. Verse 5, it says, So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. We'll come back to that in a moment. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So we see that Jesus must go. It was urgent. It was important for him to reach out to this woman because Jesus knew she was going to become a catalyst for the gospel. And so he starts the conversation. He asks the first question, and I think that's important for us to gain. Now, the woman responds basically by asking, why are you crossing over this cultural boundary to talk to me? Look at verse 9. The woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so she's wanting to know, what do you as a Jew want to do with me as a Samaritan? And I think she's wondering, is this another man that just wants to use me? Or maybe this is a man who just wants to condemn me. Either way, I have no interest. But Jesus responds basically by saying, look, I'm crossing over for your benefit. I want to change your life. Look at verse 10. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus made it clear he had something for her. He, he didn't want something from her. Verses 13 to 14, he he kind of repeats that and says, look, the water I give, if you drink it, you'll never thirst, but it'll become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, this woman, again, is a hated Samaritan. She's living in sin, and Jesus had every excuse to play it safe and, and not get involved. But he said, forget that. I'm going to cross this boundary. I'm going to invest in this woman's life because I don't believe there's anybody that's unworthy of the gospel. And so he talks to her. Now, the woman was trying to avoid people, and I said, come back to the sixth hour. We won't go into all the details, but basically what that means, she was coming at a time when other people wouldn't be there. I mean, she didn't want to cross that boundary and have to talk to them. They didn't want to cross that boundary and have anything to do with her. So she doesn't want to talk to anyone. She ends up in this conversation with Jesus, but Jesus crosses over her discomfort and brings her back to her real need. And basically, he says, look, you might not want to talk about this, but we need to have a conversation about what's happening in your life. And so in verse 16, he says, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, well, you've well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. In that, you were telling the truth. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see what happens here. Even though it's going to be hugely uncomfortable, Jesus is basically saying this, you need to see the truth about yourself. And so he ca crosses the line of tactfulness, right? I mean, he's not being tactful here, but he does it to redeem her life. And I, I just want to share with you, that's what love does. There's nothing admirable about leaving somebody in their sin and not talking to them about what God has to say about what's going on in their life. And so she is exposed, and her failure is revealed, and, and she says, I have no husband, and, and Jesus basically says, yeah, no joke. No joke. Now, as a side note, I think it's important to remind ourselves that Jesus knows your story. He knows my story. He knows what's going on in your heart. He sees behind whatever mask we might choose to wear at any given time. And initially, we think that's bad news. It's actually really good news because it means that even though God knows your story, he still came to die to redeem it. He still came to save you and to change the direction of your story. Jesus came to remove my sin, not so I could hide it. Jesus died on the cross so I could take my sin and bring it out in the open and dump it at the cross and leave it there. And I want to encourage you to do that. 
so that we can cross over from death unto life. Well, it's interesting. Things get uncomfortable now for her, right? You can imagine. And she does what most of us do when we get uncomfortable in the conversation. She changes the subject. Jesus wants to talk about a relationship with God. She decides to ask some ridiculous question about religion. Verse 19, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. You Jews on that, you know, say that in Jerusalem is a place where you ought to worship. And, and so she's trying to change the subject. She doesn't want to talk about this anymore. And her question is a smokescreen. She doesn't want to deal with her sin and shame. She doesn't want to deal with her broken relationship with God. You ever have that happen? And you're talking to somebody and you're starting to talk about your personal relationship with Christ and they want to know, well, how many angels can fit on the head of a pin, you know? Or they want to know, well, why did God order the Jews to kill those people in Israel? That's a real popular one right now. You know, there's a couple atheists out there who are actually training millennials and, and, and understanding why they should be atheists because of the hateful God of the Old Testament. And so they'll come at you with some question, and really it's just a diversion because they don't really want to talk about their relationship with God. They want to talk about religion. And so Jesus doesn't let her get away with that, and he crosses another major line in verses 21 to 24. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Look at this bold-faced confrontation. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so Jesus crosses this line of political correctness and tolerance. And he says, look, there's only one way. And by the way, you're wrong, and I'm right. That doesn't float too much in today's culture, right? But that's the way Jesus approached it. Because I, the answer is not mere tolerance. The answer is love. I have a friend from high school. His name is Dave. He lives in Denver, Colorado. And about 10 years, 15 years after we graduated, Dave came to a reunion with his gay partner. And so unbeknownst to me, Dave was gay. He said he realized it in college, and so he's been living in homosexual relationships ever since. And we reconnected on Facebook, and as a result of that, I would go out to ski once in a while in Colorado, and I had stopped and had breakfast with Dave once and lunch with Dave once, and we've kept in contact. But he will always try to bring up my view of homosexuality and especially gay marriage. You know, and... He wants me to tolerate him. In fact, he's used that word many, many times. He says, why can't you tolerate my lifestyle? And I said, Dave, I'm never going to settle for tolerating you. I love you too much to just tolerate you. And I said, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Now, I'm not bringing this up, but if you're going to ask me what I believe the Bible teaches, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't think it teaches that that's okay, and here's why. You know, and it's hard for him because he, he believes I'm in tolerant, and I'm trying to help him to understand that tolerance is a cheap substitute for love. Now, if you don't believe that, let me give you a, an illustration. I've been married 35 plus years to my wife, Donna. We have four daughters, three married, 12 grandkids, by the way. And, um, but if I sent her a Valentine card this February and wrote this in, I want you to imagine how she would respond. My dearest wife, I tolerate you more than you could ever know. I have tolerated you from the first moment I saw you. In fact, nobody tolerates you as much as I do. <laughs> now, if I sent her that card, I, I guarantee you this, my wife would not tolerate it. <laughs> just would not happen. All right? So Jesus is not, is not just tolerating this woman. He's entering her story so he can reconnect her with God. And the only way this can happen is she has to get real with God. No charades, no masks, no excuses, no blame shifting. She has to own her stuff in spirit and in truth. Honestly and wholeheartedly, it has to be genuine. And that's the key issue. The only way she can cross over to a new life is to make it personal. She has to come clean with God. And by the way, the same is true for us, right? So I'd ask, you know, have you ever come clean with God? Well, she's not quite ready to cross that line, and so she has one last objection, and she tries to procrastinate, verse 25. She said, you know, basically, you know, the Messiah is coming someday, and when he comes, he'll tell us all things. I'll wait till that happens. But she have a shot coming, right? 
Because in verse 26, Jesus says, uh, that's me. <laughs> I'm right here. Yeah. I mean, and it's her moment of truth. She's face to face with the Messiah. Had to blow her mind. But can I tell you, interestingly enough, there's a little side note that starts at verse 27. She's not the only one that, that's surprised. The disciples come up, and you can read the text there. They're surprised that Jesus is talking to this woman. And it begs the question, how could they be surprised? They're his closest friends. They're in his inner circle. They knew what his mission was, and somehow they missed it. And I think they have the same problem that we saw in the video, the same problem sometimes we have. They became so self-focused and inward-focused, they forgot about the mission of God. It's easy to do. Our preferences and our hopes and dreams get in the way. As I pastored for 22 years, I got to tell you, the biggest struggle I had was keeping the, outward, the arrows focused outward. In established churches of, of 10 years or more, it takes 70 adults to reach one adult for Christ in a year. I'm not talking about kids coming to Christ. I'm talking about adults outside the church. It takes 70 to reach one. In a new church plant, that ratio drops to three to one. And that tells you the power of inward focus versus outward focus because church plants know we can't survive unless we're outward focused. And that's what happens, that whole club analogy, the metaphor that we just saw. And that's why I switched over, by the way, from pastoring. I, I pastored a great church. I love that church. They're my supporting church. They, they support me at a good number, and I'm heavily involved in the church. They got a great new guy that's come in to pastor them. But I changed roles from pastoring to doing what I'm doing now because I want to help churches toward move outward toward the mission of God. And so many are inward focused. To plant new churches focused on reaching lost people. Not some of these new churches that get planted and they just steal people from all these other churches. We're talking about planting churches in such a way that they decrease lostness in that city, in that town. Raising up next generation leaders. That's why I'm here. I mean, I'd rather do nothing really than what I'm doing today and, and be in front of some young people that, that maybe God would call out and say, you could be part of a church plant team. And it doesn't have to be as the lead church planner. It could be in a variety of roles. But to reach out to some of the people groups around you. I've been up to Moody Northwest in Spokane. And i got to tell you, one of the awesome things I've seen there, now I haven't been here enough to know whether you're doing this, so I'm not making a comparison. I'm just letting you know it's been awesome to see how much they're involved in reaching international students at Eastern Washington, Washington State, and Gonzaga universities. Now, I don't even know if you have that opportunity here. But I just think it's really, really cool. And I'm praying that some of you will join me. doesn't necessarily have to be me personally, but join in this mission. Well, the disciples are shocked. Let's kind of wrap up this story at the boundaries that Jesus crossed. I think they would have been more shocked if they knew the boundaries the woman was crossing. Look at verse 28. She left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. She leaves her water pot and indicates a change, a conversion in her life. She moves away from what she was doing. She engages with the very people that she was trying to avoid. Unbelievable. She takes a huge risk to make a relational connection. And the result, if you look at verse 39, is reproduction and multiplication. Look at what happens. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. The gospel did not stop with her. And I always ask this question, has it stopped with you? I mean, is there anyone on the face of this planet that knows Jesus today because you invested in their life? Doesn't mean you're the one that prayed with them, but you opened a door, you had an influence, you shared your story with them. Because she crossed over, they crossed over. A bunch of Samaritans accepted a Jewish rabbi as their savior. And they even went beyond what the disciples understood at that, mo at that point, and they understood that he was savior of the world. So here's where I want to stop and, and just reflect on your willingness and my willingness to cross over. So let me ask you just individually, how willing are you to cross over? Will you cross over the aisle wherever you go to church and meet somebody new that maybe shows up for the first time? Will you cross the street to talk with your neighbor? You know, it's been 
kind of cool for us. We moved from Indiana to Salem, Oregon about 13, 14 months ago and to start crossing over and getting to know our neighbors as more of a lay person than as the pastor of a local church. Well, you cross over to another campus and reach international. So I, again, I don't even know if there is one here in Reading, but would you do that? Will you cross over your prejudice to reach out to someone radically different than you? Maybe a different people group. Maybe a different sexual orientation. What barriers does God want you to cross? I mean, think right now of one person who needs you to cross over. Get somebody fixed in your mind and ask yourself, what could you do to open a relational door? What could you do, what could you say to maybe break the ice? A lot of times it's just inviting them into your home inviting them into your home. There's a story of a young Muslim who came over from Saudi Arabia, and he brought a, a, this is a true story, actually, he brought a suitcase full of gifts because in his culture, when someone hosts you in their home, you give them a gift. He left with every gift still in his suitcase because not one person invited him into their home. Isn't that amazing? We have opportunities all around us. Just uh, yesterday, I had lunch after I spoke at a Spanish church in the morning and then at an Anglo church in the same facility after that. And then the pastor and his wife and a missionary and his wife and I all went out to, to eat. And we got talking with the waitress. Very, it actually happened easily. Sometimes not, it's not so easy. But she got talking, and we started asking her about her family. And she has a daughter that's 13, and she has a son, Cole, who's nine. And I mentioned his name because I'm going to ask you to pray for him as well. Her name is Danya. So it's kind of an interesting name. I've never heard it before, but her name is Danya. And you could pray for her. The result of just talking to her and asking her, hey, we're going to pray in a moment for our food. Do you mind if we pray for Cole? And she said no, and she had tears in her eyes. That would be great. And she actually lives in the neighborhood of the church where I spoke. And so she may come to that church, probably not saved. So if you could pray for Danya and Cole, but that happens just as a result of being willing to cross over. And so what about your willingness to cross a culture? Maybe even cross an ocean as a missionary. You know, your president talked about the fact that there's several alumni that's even with our mission organization. And you have to ask yourself, is there a barrier I'm unwilling to cross? So I'll just close with this story. The prodigal son, right? You all know the story. It's interesting to look at the context. Verses 1 and 2, the religious leaders in chapter, Luke chapter 15, they're asking the disciples, why is Jesus hanging out with his sinners? And so Jesus answers the question by telling three stories. One's about a lost coin, one a lost sheep, and one a lost son. But there's a significant difference between the first two stories and the third one. I don't know if you'll figure it out, but the significant difference is this. In the first two, the person who loses the coin and the sheep go on an all-out search for what was lost. In the third story, no one goes looking for the son. The question is why? We know it's not the heart of the father. He couldn't wait for the son to come home. Well, the answer is within the text. When the prodigal comes to the father and says, I want my inheritance, it says, so the father divided it among them. The older brother would have had two-thirds. The younger brother had one-third. So guess who had the resources to go look for his younger brother? It was the older son. And what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees is, you are the older brother. And I've come to reach the prodigals because you failed to do what God has given you to do. And when we think about ourselves in 2016, who has the resources of the Father and the opportunity to reach out and rescue the prodigal? It's me and it's you. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And I just want to share this. The quickest way to get out of God's will for your life and, and not be engaged in what God really wants you to do is to lose your heart for the prodigal. To basically say to God, you know what? I'm not going to use my resources. I'm not going to use my talent or abilities to reach out to prodigals. And so I want to encourage you maybe today to put a stake in the ground and say, you know what? It's, it's time for me. Or maybe I, I'm going to do it in new ways. New, you know, I'm really going to focus on praying and engaging with those who are lost. I hope that you'll do that. There's a lot of opportunities out there right around you and in the world to be involved in, in crossing over and reaching people who need Christ. So as we close, I want to let you know there's a bunch of brochures back here on the table. Some of those are new. They'll give you some idea for students, um, both short-term and long-term internships and so forth. 
We're in about 70 countries around the world that we're involved in pretty much anywhere around the world that you'd want to be involved in. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can be involved. And I thought I would show you, do we have time to show about a two and a half minute video? You sure? Okay. We have a, about a two and a half minute video. We have some hospitals around the world. One of those is in Bangladesh. And that's where um, we we're talking about that one of your alumni are working there in Bangladesh. And so I just want you to see some of what you can do. And I think this is a good way to kind of close chapel today, thinking about crossing over. In a country like Bangladesh, I can really resonate with the words of C.T. Studd from more than a century ago. He said that some yearn to live within the sound of a church bell. I'd rather run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. When I was a fourth year surgical resident, God planted a seed in my mind and it was irrational by human standards, and that was that I would take three months out of my surgical training while on a military scholarship and go overseas. My three months in Africa serving with World Medical Mission, God used that time immensely to help me to refine my thinking about where he might be leading me when I finished my surgical training. Somewhere along the line, we North Americans got it in our head that life is supposed to be risk-free. I don't know where that comes from. It's not in the Bible. I think that God is deeply honored when we take some risks for Him and we step out in faith to serve Him. Every day that I go to work, I see those who are lost without the gospel. Thousands and thousands of people are dying from preventable diseases, from surgical illnesses that we can readily treat. Moreover, these people are dying without Christ, and they're going to a Christless eternity unless we hold out the hope of physical healing and the hope of the gospel. About a week and a half ago, Setada was walking along a country road, and she was clipped by a Jeep and crushed, and uh, when the driver noticed that she wasn't dead, he then tried to back over and tried to finish her off because it's a lot cheaper to kill a person than it is to fix a broken person in this country. It's too horrifying for words to even contemplate doing that to a 12-year-old girl. This is truly the modern parable of, of the Good Samaritan and uh, somebody who's fallen into the, the hands of unrighteous people and left for dead is, is a shocking reality even in the 21st century. Serving Christ in a situation like this is no sacrifice. This is a high and holy privilege that we have. God honors what little commitments we make and he blesses us a thousand times over. Many people think that um, by giving up um, a three-car garage and giving up a lucrative surgical practice that that has somehow uh, been a real challenge for me. I think it all comes down to having an eternal perspective. If this life is all that there is, yes, that would be a sacrifice. If we understand that our lives are eternal and our life here on earth is just a mere speck and eternity goes on forever, then serving Christ in this kind of a situation becomes a privilege because we're investing for eternity. At the end of the day, there is nothing that I would rather be doing than the ministry to which God has called me at Memorial Christian Hospital.